Hi, today we're going to talk about classifications inside your CMMS or EAM. So a classification is a list of attributes uh, that can be then applied to another record inside your CMMS for you to populate values associated with attributes. So what the heck are attributes? Uh, so if we take the example of a classification for an AC motor, uh, there would be attributes such as its horsepower, its rotations per minute, uh, its service factor, frame size. All of these attributes are really what you would look up, say, as a planner in order to order a new one. Uh, and so those attributes get connected to a class structure. And the values then get populated when you apply the classification. So if I apply the classification to the equipment record associated to a motor, I can then say exactly what horsepower that motor is. And so attributes and values are a list inside the database. You then apply those to different types of records, such as your asset or equipment record, items or spare parts. They're the most common use for classifications. However, that is not the only use for classifications. So we'll look through some of those as well. Now, a couple of things to remember. When you create your classification database, that should be standardized. There shouldn't be 50 different ways to say that this is an AC motor. Uh, when you build your class structure, have one way to say it's an AC induction motor, and it applies to all your AC motors. Uh, so let's look at some of the other pieces where we can use a class structure. That class structure can be assigned to assets or equipment, can also be assigned to inventory items. So in your inventory item list, you'll have a list of attributes. Now, sometimes you can buy a database with a list of attributes, or there are some ISO standards associated with those values or attributes. Now, one of the things you should understand is that's not a stopping point. You can add other values in an attribute list. Let's say, for example, on your inventory items, you want to know what the G10 number is or the UNSPSC code is. You can add an attribute for that value and in the classification associated with that item number, you can then put the G10 number. Same thing for job plans, locations, notifications. You can assign classifications to a lot of different types of records and for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons folks move to smart numbering systems is they're not really sure where to put certain details of information. I am not a fan of smart numbering systems. Keep your database simple, keep all your numbers dumb, and if you need fields to house data, they either already exist or you should create them. One of the inexpensive ways to create a new field inside your CMMS is to apply it to a classification. And so if on your job plans you want to know what type of equipment it's associated to, create a classification for job plans associated to an AC motor. So you're still using the AC motor classification name, but associated with the records of job plans. And on the records of job plans, you may have different lists of attributes. Uh, is this a repair job plan or a PM job plan? All those things could be attributes, and then you would list the values. This is a PM job plan, or this is a corrective order job plan. Uh, lo locations. Locations is a great mechanism for uh, classification attributes, particularly in the service industry. In the service industry, you might want to know paint color schemes and ceiling tile grid sizes and ceiling tile numbers. I know they change all the time. Um, carpet tile numbers, uh, primary paint color, secondary paint color, color um, outlet fixture colors, and, and you know all kinds of different things. Inside your um, bathrooms, you might want to know what the urinal flushometer number is or what the toilet number is. All those things could be classification attributes that you associate to a location. Same thing with notifications or service requests. Your notifications can have a classification structure. And in some cases, you guys have phone numbers that people dial up and they say, hey, I need some help, or hey, the bathroom's clogged, or hey, the, the water's leaking. And 
there's not enough information that gets translated to the work order. And so we're dispatching people immediately for work orders. One of the unique ways to use a classification attribute system at the notification level would be to ask questions. Somebody says this is a leak, you assign a classification, it says plumbing leak. And then it lists attributes and those attributes could be, well, is it a drip or is it pouring water? Because that's a big difference between if I dispatch somebody immediately or I can wait an hour before I send somebody over there and they can button up the job they're doing. Uh, so a lot of unique scenarios around classifications and I wish I could get into them all, but we're trying to keep the video short. A couple things to keep in mind. S keep standardized in your naming conventions for your classification. So make sure that you don't have multiples or duplicates of the same type of assets. Uh, also, this can build your descriptions. And so instead of having all these, you know, you've got 800 inventory items in a system that just say bearing, if you populate your classification attributes, then that attribute list can become the description. So let's say, uh, again, we'll use our example for an AC motor. If I fill out those attributes, my description becomes motor, comma, AC, comma, um, I, I don't know, whatever, 150 horsepower, comma, frame size, blah, blah, blah. Comma. So it becomes standardized and all of your descriptions where you've applied the classification system will be standardized immediately. Uh, okay, a couple other things. Uh, they can be used as user-defined fields. We talked about that in most systems, probably all systems, but I can't speak to every system. Um, they are searchable, so you can actually search on attribute values, so you can get the data back. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is to try to create a hierarchy structure, particularly when it comes to your assets or equipment records. What I like to do is create a tangent from your class structure. This should also be your failure codes. So if I have, at least for classifications associated to equipment, if I have an equipment class for a pump, I should have a failure hierarchy for a pump. One to one relationship there. I shouldn't have 25 different ways to say pump. Now there's different types of pumps, but if your asset class classification is a centrifugal pump, then you should have a failure code hierarchy for a centrifugal pump. If it's, um, you know, whatever, the piston pump, some other type of pump, then you should have a failure code hierarchy for that as well. So try to keep your failure codes, your classification, your asset types, your asset classes, that's all one list. And then you have to build the failure code hierarchy. We'll talk about failure codes in another video. And I think that's enough for now in terms of classifications and classification attributes. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, we'll just uh, pick that up in another video in the future if we want to add some more detail. But essentially, that's it. Have a great day.